Welcome to another episode of Digital Punks, your one-step destination for music NFTs and Web3 with Lucas and Chris. Yeah. So today we have got Sammy. Sammy is a singer-songwriter based in Nashville, Tennessee, and is behind the successful music NFT project Pixelated. Pixelated is an NFT collection consisting of 4,000 NFTs designed by Chloe Zorn. And Pixelated is a song about digital love and appreciating someone's bit of beauty, pixel for pixel. The collection includes 12 unique versions of the song, from a salsa version to an 80s style track, acoustic and even a symphony version. Sammy is at the forefront of the music NFT revolution and we are thrilled to have him today with us to talk about the past, the present and the future. We hope this conversation inspires artists to join the space and experiment and fans to join and become collectors, avid supporters of an artist and follow their musical journey. We also hope it provides transparency to the fan experiences of artists uh, that they are trying to build. So let's do it. All right. But before we jump in, the fourth poet of uh, Digital Punk's poet Genesis Collections is dropping today and you can claim it until the 2nd of April. Like last times, we will donate 50 cents per power mint to a music project for underprivileged children in Munich who would otherwise not have the opportunity to get musical education and learn an instrument. So you're doing something good by minting a power so do it. And now let's dive right in. All right, Sammy, welcome. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, how you grew up and what kind of music influenced your upbringing? Absolutely, guys. Um, my name is Sammy Ariaga. I'm originally from Miami, Florida, uh, all the way down in, in this most southern point of, of uh, the, the Sunshine State. And uh, I was raised actually listening to a lot of like Latin music, Spanish music, because my whole family is from the island of Cuba. Um, so, so Spanish is actually my first language. A lot of people don't know that. Um, and so I grew up listening to a, a wide variety of, of tracks, you know, in the Latin world, R&B, hip hop, with Miami being so, you know, such a melting pot for all kinds of cultures. Um, but it wasn't until like my late teens that I discovered country music. Mm. And so I moved to Nashville, Tennessee to pursue a career in country music, representing my Latin roots and, uh, you know, be a representative of the Hispanic culture in, in, in that genre. And I've just been living here since, pursuing the artist's dream. Um, you know, used to be signed to Sony Music back in 2017. Um, you know, worked with the likes of WME and CAA, some of the largest booking agents in the world as well. Mm -hmm. um, toured the country, you know, um, opening up for a tons, of, tons of bigger artists and, you know, uh, spreading the word about the music. <laughs> and then uh, in late 2022, I'm uh, sorry, 2021, uh, I discovered Web3. And I've uh, been building in this space ever since. Uh, now I've been probably building in a, music NFTs now for about 13, 14 months or so. Um, and since the start of that, you know, we've been able to build an incredible community of collectors um, that understand the true value of what it means, uh, you know, for a singer songwriter like myself to, you know, create these digital assets in, you know, during the early days of their music career. Um, and we've been blessed, you know, to say that. Since we started selling music NFTs, we've now surpassed over 12,000 music NFTs minted. Wow. Um, our first collection was 1,500. Uh, second collection was 1,000. Third collection was 4,000. Um, we did a few secondary drops on sound as well. And then we recently did an open edition, uh, which recently surpassed 6,000 open edition mints. Um, only eight ETH in volume short from Snoop Dogg's open edition yeah. record. Um, we going for that so, record. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, we were really hungry for that record. Um, we even got a tweet from Snoop Dogg's son himself saying oh, you love wow. to see it. So a lot of cool things happened during the last couple of weeks. Um, but yeah, I mean, we've been blessed over the last year with an incredible opportunity to, uh, you know, represent music and NFTs and also help other artists in the space find direction and, and see how they can also break the chains of the traditional music industry and, and use music and NFTs mm -hmm. to connect you know on a deeper level with their biggest supporters all over the world yeah and i'm we're, we're really uh, i mean everyone in this space uh, you know um lucas and myself included i think what you're doing the the work that you're doing is very very important work also not i mean you're not making it happen for only yourself right but you're really uh, establishing a blueprint for other artists 
because at the end of the day, it's it's also really cool to know, uh, you know, that what you're doing is influencing other artists to go into that space and embrace that new technology that you own. If you if you don't mind, like me going back, um, is there is there part because you, you were talking about your Hispanic roots, uh, and then you were talking about uh, going into country. Was there a specific uh, experience that you had? May that be like in your childhood or like you growing up that made you say, wow, I want to be a musician. I want to play an instrument. I want to write music. Yeah. Um, so growing up, my dad was always um, playing this uh, classical guitar that was just mm. sitting in his office. Um, and he would always play these Cuban ballads um, from the island, very famous um, songs. And I used to always love it. It used to always bring so much joy to me. And, uh, and then he used to always tell me that my grandfather was the singer of the family. He was the ballad singer that would jump on tables in Cuba and like serenade all the women and captivate the room and whatnot. And, um, and then one day out of the blue, I was just, you know, didn't really have much to do. I, and my dad was at work. I picked up the guitar and I was noodling around, just like, yeah. you know, playing with the strings or whatever. And, and then something hit me. I'm like, why don't I just go to YouTube and like put how to play the guitar. Mm -hmm. And I searched how to play the G chord, how to play the C chord, how to play the D chord. And then after a while, you know, of doing it over and over and over again, um, it just kind of clinged. It, it just latched on and uh, I fell in love with it. I felt powerful. I felt like, look what I can do. You know what I mean? And it just gave me, it gave me purpose. It gave me something to do. It was a challenge. I love a good challenge. And, uh, It allowed me to speak my emotions and just say what I got to say in a, in a whole new way. Um, it also won me points in school with the girls that I liked. So I brought <laughs> that nice. guitar to school every single day. Um, but, uh, but yeah, just, uh, I, I fell in love with writing. I started writing lyrics, um, and, you know, using my, my phone to record what I, whatever I came up with. And mm -hmm. over time, I discovered that country music was a genre that I really enjoyed because of the storytelling element of it all. Um, and I love that you can, you know, sing your heart out. And I just love what it represents um, and how, you know, you can say what you have to say with just you and a guitar. That's amazing. Can you tell us a little bit about your creative process? It's interesting for the listeners and to us as well how you go about writing new music new songs are you still noodling around with the guitar or mm -hmm. <laughs> writing the lyrics first what's your process there yeah I, i sometimes i'll come up with a guitar lick like a little guitar riff that you know clings on that's catchy um sometimes i'll have a song title just lying around in my phone that you know i uh that was inspired by a, a heartbreak or a situation, you know, an event mm -hmm. in life. Um, a lot of my songs, uh, funny enough, are inspired by some of uh, the things that my friends go through. So like yeah. if my friends go through mm -hmm. a breakup, I'll talk to them about it and be like, let's go get a beer and talk about it. Because when they tell me about it, I kind of steal from their situation, from their, from their experience. Yeah. And, uh, and then I'll be like, hey, I wrote this for you. Thanks to your heartbreak, I, you came, you know, this song was born. And so there's always a, a light at the end of the dark tunnel. So, um, that's, yeah, I try to find inspiration in everything I can. And, um, but mainly my, the things that inspire me the most are guitar riffs and song titles. And that's how Meta Girl was born. Meta Girl was just a, a song title that I came up with. I mean, I thought of the word metaver and girl, and I'm like, Meta Girl. And so I just, yeah, it's easy. So I, I didn't, I didn't know if there was a song about somebody falling in love with a girl in the metaverse yet. So I was like, I'd like to be the first one to it. So, <laughs> and so we came up with Meta Girl, and ever since then, you know, the song has done some pretty cool stuff. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm excited to see once you know mass adoption comes into play with the metaverse and the mm -hmm. NFTs and whatnot. I'm excited to see how that influences the success of the song. So. We'll see. Now you're really uh, you're really building like this this really big Web 3 music footprint for yourself, right? Um, but there there was there was a time where um, you were focusing on your career, embracing the technology outside of blockchain technology, right? Um, streaming, 
um, working with labels, management, etc. Can you can you describe like um, what were like some of the challenges for you as an artist um, that that came up, uh, you know, uh, that you faced building up your career? I would say the what the the one the number one struggle that I feel like all artists can agree with me on mm -hmm. is uh, delegation mm -hmm. um, and working with other people yeah. that you know say oh yeah I can do this for you or like yeah. I believe in you I can put you in front of this person or you know what I mean it's just they they make all these promises yeah yeah mm -hmm. they like they like make it all like you know luxurious and and keep you hopeful and whatnot um and so then you you give in and then you sign your life away to these people you know give them huge cuts of what you're you know of what you're earning and then there's no reciprocation like they don't follow through they they you know they, they fall through on their word and it's just the the vision that i have in my head for what I want for my music and, you know, and for my journey and for whatever I do, like my tour, my show, whatever. My biggest struggle is finding somebody else that can see the exact thing I see in my head and put it on paper and bring it to life. That is the biggest hurdle. And so I feel like over the years, I've worked with hundreds of managers. I've worked with hundreds of producers, hundreds of songwriters. And don't get me wrong, I'm happy that I worked with them, you know, because, you know, Every everything you do is a stepping stone closer to you know a better mm -hmm. version of you. Um, but a lot of those people were they didn't see the vision. You know what I mean? Like they just like slightly saw it. Maybe maybe not. Maybe maybe some of them didn't see it at all. But all I know is that my mission in life is to find those people that can see my vision in my head as clear as I see it. That makes sense. You know, and I feel like that's. That, that applies to any field as well. Like any, it doesn't just have to be music. It can be art. It can be video. It can be anything. Um, and business in general is like, you know, a founder having to trust other people with their baby, you know, it's mm. like babysitting. It's like you leaving your home and saying, hey, I'm, I'm trusting you to take care of my baby, you know, yeah. Yeah. and, and not sense. being around to see what they're doing. So that's yeah. been my biggest struggle over the years is like, being able to execute on my vision and trusting other people to do the same as efficiently as I would. It's your personal brand at the, at the end of the day, right? You got to protect it. Right. As well. So you, you need to think about who you're letting in, in through the door. Yeah, I mean, totally. who better, who, who better to explain digital punks than the two digital punks themselves? You know what I mean? <laughs> so that's kind of, that's kind of how I see it. Yeah. Makes sense. Did you did you find that it changed with Web3 coming into this or is it exactly the same with building an NFT project or is it easier to trust people maybe with Web3 coming in? Did that change for you or doesn't that change the perspective at all? Uh, it, it's the same thing. If anything, it's worse because NFTs are very money related mm -hmm. and uh, they're very volatile. And so, you know, one day your floor price can be above a certain amount and everybody's your best friend. And then, you know, all of a sudden the market goes to shit. Sorry about, excuse my French, but the market goes to, you know, goes down. Mm -hmm. yep, so. And and then all of a sudden people flip the switch and now they're not your best friend. Now they're like, what are you doing? Why is my floor low? Why is my investment appreciated? Mm -hmm. and, then, and then they're your enemy. So... It's a tricky, it's a tricky market. You know, it's a tricky world that we're, we're dabbling in. And especially mm -hmm. being a creator, um, it's a very fine line because, you know, it's, it's your craft. It's, it's me. It's, 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 it represents Sammy Arriaga. So whatever I put out there as a song, as a visual, if people let the, the monetary value of it all get in the mm -hmm. way of the, of the, of the actual art, mm. It, it takes away from the, the true meaning of what I'm trying to do. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You Maybe before we go uh, in how you entered Web3, you said it puts pressure on you if the market is down. Is, it, is that a negative side of Web3 in your opinion? Or how does that feel for you as an artist? Not really. Um, it, 
I, I think it's inevitable. I think it's about, you know, finding a crowd that, that invest into what you're doing, not because of the volatility, not because of the monetary value, but because of the art that they're buying into. Like they're, find you people that are going to be proud of being in your ecosystem and they're not going to care what the value of those assets are. Now, don't get me wrong. There's always going to be, I always want them to care a little bit. You know what I mean? Because at the end of the day, if you buy five of my NFTs and my floor value goes to two ETH, three ETH, and you can sell one of those for 20 times the price that you initially bought it for, I personally would DM you and go, sell it. Because I want you to win. That's the whole point of, of this space is yes. to allow other people to win through the art that I create. Yeah. You know, you know, at the end of the, but that also means, you know, sometimes taking a hit and, and that's also where you kind of see the true colors of a supporter. It's the same, like, with a football, right. With a football club or, uh, you know, like your favorite basketball team, if they're doing bad and they're doing bad, those fans that, uh, you know, uh, see you losing, those are the ones turning on you. But in, in the end, they should be the ones supporting you and saying, well, you know, uh, you need to pick yourself up next game. You're going to win. So, you know, And what you're saying is it's a, it should be a win-win situation where when you right. win as an artist and you're progressing your career, then the, the collector also wins. Yeah, and it's also like, you know, just because, like, for example, the, just a few weeks ago, our floor value was 0.15 um, on Pixelated. Thank the Lord. Um, you know, we've been blessed with some pretty cool stuff. And, you know, over time, you know, with the market being a mess right now and, people, you know, liquidating and trying to diversify their portfolio. Um, we've noticed that our, our floor has dipped to below 0.1. Now it's at 0.08 or 0.07, something like that. But it's okay because now that holder went at 0.15 when they heard my song, mm -hmm. they couldn't enter because they didn't have the, the funds. But now they can because of the, you know, because the floor value is a little lower and they're able to do that entry point. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, you know, um, in 2021, is, it was really the narrative of um, a lot of art projects coming out and music NFTs were not part of the narrative that, that really came, you know, kicked in gear when um, you, Violetta, um, TK, etc. entered the scene. And um, I also hear this uh, a lot of times, um, you know, as an artist, you should not um, connect your worth as an artist to the price of your asset at the end of the day. Right. Ever, ever. If anything, the, the asset represents what it represents. You know, it's the, the music is the music and the art is the art. You know, the value is simply set by the collector. You know, that's and that's not going to stop us from from writing more records, from from creating more videos, you know, from doing what we do best. And that's perform. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, let's get into the juicy stuff like uh, tell, tell us a little bit about pixel the pixelated project and maybe your long-term vision i know that that it's about um you know uh digital uh digital love and appreciating someone's beauty pixel by pixel and that's that's how we came up with the concept and i really yeah. think also um you know the, the 12 different versions of the songs that's really unique like to think about 12 different versions of a song and it just shows the the character of you know coming up with something innovative in your in your music as well thanks man yeah so i wanted to create um you know just uh, a way for my listener to to wear the stripes you know mm -hmm. to wear the soccer jersey if you will um and so i i'm like why don't i make a pfp collection inspired by a song right and then you know make the song very web3 driven you know digital futuristic mm -hmm. uh you know with the lyrics and the melodies um this is also the first song that i ever produced more than once um mm -hmm. especially in, in this many genres Yeah. Um, and the reason why we did that is because we, we wanted to create a, a, a gamification system um, via a PFP collection um, to offer utility to collectors mm -hmm. as they collect the different you know, versions of the same song. Um, and so that's how we structured out our, our utility map for Pixelated. Um, mm -hmm. When you have one, you know, there's a certain amount of perks. When you go to three, there's a, there's a batch of perks. When you get to six, etc. Um, and then of course, you know, we have over 150 unique traits within the pixelated, uh, trait collection. Um, and, uh, 
you know, we, we started minting back in June. Um, we, we actually had a pretty interesting minting process. Um, we had a deflationary mint, meaning mm-hmm. that we started the mint at the public. So we started it at, a, at the highest price, which was 0.1. And so we were able to mint a uh, thousand at 0.1. Um, and then once we reached the thousand, we made it to the second stage of the minting process, which was uh, 0.07. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when we reached the 0.07 mark, we went to the 0.05 mark. And then when we went to the 0.05 mark, we get to the 0.03 mark, and then we sold out. Um, so we intentionally depreciated it from 0.1 to 0.03. And then mm-hmm. once we sold out, all the, the NFTs just like we're starting to get swept up all the way from 0.03, all the way back up to 0.1. It was pretty cool to watch, um, but it was a three, three and a half, it was a three and a half, four month process. It was, it was quite a, a long time, um, but it was, it was so cool. The community stuck around, they held strong. Um, and uh, now I think we have over 30 unique holders with one or more ultimate utility nft sets meaning that they've collected all the 12 versions of pixelated the five meta girl the five meta girl heart colors from the first collection from the genesis and then a pulse pass because that's what you need you need five from meta girl one pulse pass 12 song versions Uh, i think we have um two holders now with two ultimate utilities so they have a total of, of 36 nfts um, wow. And they are, they're unlocking Matt's utility twice. Yeah. So yeah. it's it's pretty cool. And, uh, you know, it's just really cool to watch the community, you know, understand, um, you know, as an artist grows, yeah. um, you know, via, you know, these platforms like TikTok, Instagram, they go on tour, you know, they get to play at some of these, you know, arenas and bigger stages. That's going to influence the value of all of these assets. And it's mm-hmm. also going to increase demand for the utility that we're offering, you know, via the mm-hmm. pixelated collection. And so it's been really cool to do spaces as well on Twitter and uh, see people rocking the PFPs and uh, tell the world that they're, they're a Sammy yeah. lover. You know, they're a Sammy listener. Um, and it's, uh, it's really humbling and it's a, it's a cool spot mm-hmm. to be in. I was, I was going to say, I mean, uh, seeing that someone changes their picture because uh, their picture on Twitter that's their sort of digital identity, right? Also going forward, yeah. like we're, we're going to be spending parts of our daily life um, interacting with, may that be like augmented reality or like virtual reality with our PFP. So I think like what you said, this experience also makes you very humble. It, um, it's just a great appreciation of your art and your music and what you're putting out. So um, that, that must be a, really like a com- confirmation of you know where you're going you're on a really good path yeah absolutely i mean just people seeing just seeing people wearing the stripes and you know posting tweets about their pixelated and yeah. you know showing their kids you know running around the house listening to these different versions of the song um and doing you know i don't know just uh show, spreading the love that yeah. you know and, and seeing how like NFTs have impacted people's lives from all over the world in places that I've never even heard of before. That is just, uh, it's really cool. And uh, it wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't for this, you know, technology. It's, it's just crazy. And music is, at the end of the day, music is borderless, right? And it unites us. Um, it's, it's, it, it doesn't matter what language you speak, like what culture you're part of. Music un- unites us, and um, you can relate to lyrics that you sing. I was um, something that came into my mind. Is there is there a version you made twelve versions? Is there one one song version that you like the most? Uh, I think the symphony version. Yeah, the sim- the symphony is my favorite, man. Um, it, it was really cool to see it all come together. I had never worked with a, sy- a symphonic uh, arrangement. Uh, this is the first time I ever hear one of my songs with like cellos and violins and you know and all that stuff. So when I first heard the mix, I I got so emotional. I'm like, oh my god, this is like actually happened, you know. Um, so it was really cool. Um, and uh, it's re- it's been really interesting hearing the community's feedback as well. I mean, I hear a lot of people say that the '80s version is their favorite because it's upbeat and it's like double time and that's it's my like favorite retro- version. Of- 
That's my is it favorite. really? Yeah, I, I love 80s music. Listen, I, I Hugh Lewis and the news, like Power of Love, Back to the Future. That's there my job. <laughs> mm-hmm. so, yeah. We even have the ca- 80s fan. Yeah. We have the cassette tape in the beginning when it's like, sh- sh- like you have like the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. Love it. So we yeah. talked about community and how you love to see how they all use the NFTs, listen to the different versions. So um, what are some of the challenges maybe that come with community building? Are there any challenges in doing that? Because you're, you have yeah. to interact with them all of the time, more than mm-hmm. in the real world probably, right? Absolutely. I think the, the main challenge is that in the NFT space right now, um, a lot of collectors are struggling with uh, being part of communities where the founders aren't very involved. Um, and so when the, the founder is involved, they, they really want like that founder to be around all the time. They want them to be like on spaces, on the DMS, on the discord. Like they want, they want to see the founder constantly around like present. Um, but the thing is that in my situation, you know, I'm a very, You know, I take pride in the fact that, you know, we're, we're, we've done this all DIY, you know, where we like do it all from home and, you know, we don't have a big team. And so I take a lot of responsibility for a lot of stuff. Like I have to post TikToks, I have to post Instagram, yeah. Pinterest, YouTube. I have to shoot content, record songs, write songs, make graphics, write the Discord announcements, tweets. Mm. I mean, it's a lot. It's a lot, cool. a lot, a lot. Yeah, and so then the hardest part is the balance yeah. of all of it. Um, mm-hmm. Again, going back to the delegation thing I said earlier about mm. um, finding somebody on, you know, adding somebody to your team that can kind of take some weight off your shoulders and help you, you know, do some of these tasks um, so that you can be as efficient and as a, as energetic as possible. But I find myself struggling with uh with sleeping well and uh you know finding the uh, having the hours in the day to to do everything i need to do um and so uh i think that that's uh that's my biggest struggle right now is uh you know i don't have a big team that's helping me with a lot of stuff and so my my main goal for 2023 is to find somebody who can see the vision that i see in my head yeah and uh and help me bring it to life And I mean, it, it, it's got a click, right? Uh, if you, uh, if you work with someone, you also need, you know, you also need to kind of connect on a sort of a personal, personal level as well, right? You know, there's the chemistry just needs to match because you're going to be spending a lot of time with a person in calls, uh, in discussions, you know, talking about strategy, et cetera. I know that we talked to like T, TK the, um, the, the other day, like on an interview, and he said that he's using heavily AI to kind of try to automate this process? Is there any services that you're also using? I, I have just started dabbling in that world, uh, in the AI world. Um, I'll write like a simple message, like, a, like an announcement or, or, mm-hmm. or just a quick update. And then I'll pump it into like ChatGPT and I'll put make this more interesting or make this more like concise yeah. or gr- make this gr- grammatically, you know, correct or stuff like that. <laughs> and... Yeah. Uh, It's been, it's been really blowing my mind. Um, I love it. Um, so I'm going to be doing that more often moving forward. Um, I have been asking ChatGPT for like uh, enticing captions. So like if I post a video on like TikTok or Instagram, I'll ask it, you know, write me a, a, a captivating caption about a pickup line. And then like it'll spitball a bunch of stuff and then I'll just pick my favorite and make it my caption on Instagram, hoping that that caption can capture more views, more interaction, more shares on my, you know, on my post. So yeah, definitely experimenting with that. Um, I have been dabbling with uh, this platform called Kyber. Um, hmm. Thanks mm-hmm. to a friend of mine, Mr. Snow Capital. He made me aware that you can make like AI music videos. Mm-hmm. It's pretty yes. cool. And so I've been creating short form videos for like Instagram and TikTok using Kyber so that I can save the time of like recording myself, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and I could just like make them on, on Kyber and then just like 
make lyric videos you know what i mean and like overlay my lyrics yeah that makes sense yeah yeah so it's been really cool i did one the other day and it got like six thousand views not a lot of views for some other people but hey the song was heard six thousand times so it's it's the compound effect i mean you know like once yeah. uh, once you got good some good results then you shoot after uh, one after another and consistency is really key in that perspective correct let's talk a little bit about what possibilities we have in the nft space for musicians for upcoming musicians so how should in your opinion a musician start into this space because you're basically one of the ogs in this space what would be your advice to new musicians entering the space or trying to yeah learn more about nfts how to approach this i would say one of my biggest uh helpers early on was jumping on twitter spaces um mm -hmm. it, it's, an, it's an incredible tool to communicate to connect with people from all over the world um I do know that most, if not all NFT collections, um, they have a team of people that host spaces on a daily basis, or if not like every other day, um, and they, you know, bring the community together, everybody's rocking the PFPs. They're all talking about, you know, ways of ways that the community has promoted the, the project. Um, the founders update all the collectors on what's to come. Um, so one way that I kind of kicked off my Web3 journey is by, by putting myself in the boots of, of the collector. So I didn't, like, right off the bat, decide to create, you know? Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I decided to collect so that I can see what it feels like to be a collector and see how, you know, what, what I want, like, what I would yeah. want if, from, a, from a project, what I would want from a founder. So that that way, when when it came time for me to be the founder, I know how to approach my ecosystem, my community. And so that I kind of, did, you know, I, I applied the reverse effect, um, became a collector for two or three months, um, yeah. started collecting profile pictures and, you know, collecting NFTs from different communities um, because I did see the conversion rate um, exponentially increase when i entered a room using the hexagon the nft comp uh, verification yeah. process on twitter um mm -hmm. whenever i would enter a room wearing their nft they were like 20 times more receptive of whatever i had to say that's interesting it was that's because amazing. It, it's because it's you got it's a very tribal effect you know you're you're mm -hmm. entering a you're entering a village and there's mm -hmm. a tribe And they wear certain colors, they wear certain stripes, they wear certain garments. And that's how I look at the PFP culture is like you wear their stripes, they're listening, you know, mm, that and, and that's, yeah. And so that's kind of how I approached for the first two or three months of, you know, when I entered the space, I saw like all these different communities, like villages. Mm -hmm. And I was like, if I'm going to enter this village, I got to bring meat. I got to bring meat and go, I brought food. Very, very, very primitive, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And so that's what I did. I took my savings account. I started chipping away, collecting one NFT here, one NFT there. And then I would just hang out, be involved, study what they're doing. And then when the right time would arise, I'd be like, hey, can I sing you guys a song? And then mm -hmm. they would be like, oh my God, that's awesome. Where can I find that? And then little by little, I would trickle them in to like my other social media platforms, like the Instagrams, the TikToks. And then they'd be like, oh my God, you have almost half a million followers on TikTok. And then boom, it just like activates. Yeah, there the, you go. The, it activates the excitement. So it was all about little by little, just like one by one, replying to all my DMs, replying to all the tweets, also tweeting about that community and tagging them and retweeting them. And, It, it, it was a lot of social media interaction um, within those two or two or three months. And then I found a, a small team that um, that I felt was trustworthy to, you know, work with to mm -hmm. launch my first collection. And then when the time uh, came and I felt it was the right time, um, I said, all right, guys, well, after three, four months of building in the NFT space, I finally found the courage to launch my first music NFT. 
you know, I've been singing on spaces now for a long time. And uh, this is the only thing I'm asking you guys to do is support my project. And all of those different communities at once said, we're supporting Sammy. And they meant, and they minted us out in under a month. And it was when ETH was over 3000 and it was 1500 music NFTs, which at the time was equivalent to almost $300,000 in American dollars. Wow. Yeah. Well, this is amazing. I mean, at the end of the day, it comes down to, right. Uh, if you provide value, uh, someone's going to pay you back 10 X and that just proves it again. Yeah. You know, if you put in, put in the work and you're not, uh, you should not be too upfront of, I mean, you should be proud of your music and selling your project, but, yeah. uh, you know, you, where possible, um, you should be in there and provide value for, for other people as well. So you can find an entry way to connect. Now, um, one of the things, uh, I would be interested in, you know, secondary market sales and royalties mm-hmm. They're they're a really big yeah. part of, um, you know, making the whole journey also a little bit sustainable for artists. So now we have, we've got this royalty war a little bit going on, you know, with Blur and OpenSea, they, they cut their creator royalties now to an optional 0.5%. What's like, how do you see this development for artists? Is this something that concerns you? It definitely does concern me. Um, I think that now the, the collector having the power to pay out creator royalties, um, there's, it, there's a positive and a negative. So positive is you're really gonna know who your true supporters are like diehard supporters Mm -hmm. if they are aware of the market they're aware of these changes and they don't change the setting if they leave it at 10 even though they have the option of lowering it they leave it at 10 so you'll you'll know who like your real the real ones are right Mm -hmm. but at the same time most people in the space are are in it to make profits. They're in it to make money. And by simply knowing they can save or they could earn 9.5% more than what they would have before, mm-hmm. a lot of people are going to lean that direction. They're going to say, oh, I could earn almost 10% more of what I was making before. Hell yeah, sign me up. And they're still earning 0.5%, so they can't complain that they're not making any money. There's going to be a lot of people that are going to think like that. Um, and so that's the, that's the shitty part of, you know, of where we're at right now, but I do see the NFT space moving in the direction that every creator will have their own economy. They're mm-hmm. going to have their own ecosystem, uh, kind of like e- e-commerce, yeah. um, mm-hmm. where, where like, all these musicians have their own merch stores. They have their own websites where you can buy like their CDs, their digital albums and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. I would not be surprised if small creators like, you know, like DIY artists like myself um, start creating their own marketplaces. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if like somebody creates like the Squarespace or the Wix of NFT marketplaces where you can go and say, hey, you want to make your own NFT marketplace? Well, we have a selection of like 25 templates, you know, and you can just sign in with your wallet you know, deploy it from your, your, you know, your main wallet and you can customize it however you want, decide your own creator royalties, you know, you own the smart contract, like very much like manifold, right? Yep. But yep. For, for NFT marketplaces. And so that's the direction that, we, that we're actually leaning towards. We want to create a, a Sammy NFT marketplace where you can find all my NFTs, uh, Metagirl, mm-hmm. Pulse Pass, Pixelated, the remix, the sound drops, um, and we want to have everything in our own ecosystem where we can decide the creator royalties. Um, and we also want to launch a smart contract, like a mother smart contract that will have enforced royalties and also okay. block off some of the secondary mm-hmm. marketplaces that we don't want them to have access to our collections. Kind of like CryptoPunks did it, where like you can mm-hmm. only get CryptoPunks via their marketplace. Mm-hmm. We want to do something similar for, for, for our music NFTs. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So you talked about building your own marketplace and this, yeah, Squarespace style uh, in the future. One of the questions would be mainstream adoption. It's still far away, probably, but in your opinion, 
what what needs to happen in order to convert most of the general public to listen to music nfts to get onboarded I, there's several hurdles in my opinion i feel like even just the uh, the the simple process of downloading a crypto wallet like that alone is uh it, it's a hurdle um mm -hmm. even the word crypto um ha I've, i've noticed that a lot of people tend to run away from it because It has just such a negative connotation. Mm -hmm. um, but I do feel like the second that a larger company like builds the bridge or creates the bridge um, to be able to acquire an NFT using like Apple Pay mm -hmm. or like just yep. uh, like these quick payment systems um, like Cash App or Venmo or one of these, you know, fast transaction uh, uh, payment systems. Yep. Um, I feel like that's going to, you know, uh, allow for mass adoption because people don't have to go through the hassle of going through Coinbase and, you know, buying Ethereum, which they don't even know what it is, you know, and then they have to wait eight days until the Ethereum is live. And then they trans they don't even know how to transfer from Coinbase to MetaMask. Like nobody's yeah. teaching them these things. I had to learn yeah. this on my own. I had to ask the questions right. on Twitter spaces. So I think that. For example, like Amazon's about to launch their marketplace in exactly. April. Um, mm -hmm. I wouldn't be surprised if like they have a tool where, it, you know, you're able to pay with USD. It automatically converts it to a cryptocurrency of their liking, yes. most likely Avalanche, which is who they're working with. Um, and then, you know, having a custodial wallet so that they don't even have to download a secondary app. They can just like have it all right there. You know, most people already have an Amazon Prime account. So... Mm -hmm. Most likely, it'll just be a new tab saying like my wallet, you know, yeah. and then they can click that and they can cycle through, you know, USD or crypto or whatever, you know, it's all going to be there built in. Um, and so I feel like the second that people understand that process, first and foremost, they're going to comprehend the external apps a little easier mm -hmm. because they've already had experience with them on like an Amazon or Or yeah. another big marketplace, you know, or or company. The feeling of digital collection, right? The feeling of, yeah. I mean, may, maybe yeah. Amazon also embraces uh, music NFTs. You know, open there you has go. music NFTs. So, yeah, if if the if you got this digital collection process and people are starting to adapt this collector's mindset, that might open a door yeah. of them saying, "Well, hmm, I, so I've got this music NFT now there, but there's other platforms and other artists doing something on sound or like on OpenSea." I want to find out how to to buy this. Like, what it, it makes total sense what you're saying. Totally. I mean, I I wouldn't be surprised if like, you know, somebody like a like a music artist, you know, says, "Hey, I'm going on the road for 50 dates this year, and I'm creating a, a system where if you collect 10 of the 50, you unlock this." And mm -hmm. so then through and and through ticket stubs, like even if it's just like ticket stubs, if they yeah. save them as a as a digital ticket stub, like a PO app, like but in the form yeah. mm -hmm. like like a PO, even yeah, if they'll unlock X item, you know. And so I like you said, it's about that feeling of like getting in the habit of collecting these digital assets um, in a in a in a digital wallet. Um, where you can infinitely store these these ticket stubs or these receipts, um, proof of attendance, you know, yeah. co -op. Yeah. Um, I think people are gonna like be mind blown by it. As long as there's an incentive behind it, um, I think it's gonna yeah. really trigger that collective mindset. And some will just do collect it because they want to be able to say, "Here's my proof that I was at Drake's private acoustic concert in Nashville." on you know april fool's day yeah. yeah or whatever you know what i mean yeah so, i was at the I, first tour of that upcoming artist i mm -hmm. have the proof yeah yeah i mean even, even now like what if meta girl becomes the biggest song of the metaverse and i create mm -hmm. a pro app right now that anybody can collect to just show proof that you were a supporter in me when meta girl mm -hmm. was just going viral The value of that pull-up is going to go up through the years exponentially. It's like yeah. 
It's like somebody having a ticket stub in their in their underwear drawer of Guns and Roses when they were when yeah. they just released Welcome to the Jungle. Yeah, you know the cool thing, and the cool thing also is uh, it's it's gonna have some for people that collect it. It's gonna have some sentimental value as well, right? Because it's dear to Infinite. your heart, right? It's Infinite, it's memory yeah. building at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you could and, also have, um, you could also have like geolocation of like you know where has this where has this poet been? Almost mm -hmm. like imagine imagine it's like you had a ticket stub, and like you knew every single place that ticket stub has been since the moment of creation until the moment of discovery like mm -hmm. years later down the road you can know if it was in mexico or if it was in brazil or if it was in europe it'll tr it'll get tracked you yeah. know it'll have geolocations and yeah. this is amazing for the fans but also for you as an artist to see wow this fan has been at those shows you know this probably you don't know this from yeah, yeah. non-blockchain data you can say like oh this you know i added utility to this one poet and i tracked this one fan that has this poet and it and it shows on this heat map that this fan has used this poet in australia mm -hmm in japan in uh, in the u.s mm -hmm. and then it just shows the loyalty yeah. you know of, the, of this person using that digital asset to uh reap the, the the benefits of you know of what you're offering 100 percent. okay that that was amazing i love that discussion we're coming to the end of the interview and in the end we always go in a little personal direction one or two questions about you so the listeners get to know you better so do you have any hobbies or interests outside of music i do uh i used to play uh football soccer uh quite often nice. um that was my dream before music um i don't play it as often as i as i wish to um unfortunately but you know with all of the web3 you know stuff taking over <laughs> my life um but i uh, i definitely love soccer i love to paint I love drawing. Drawing is also a hidden, a hidden talent. Um, and I just love networking. Networking mm -hmm. is like my, you know, what, what I enjoy the most. I love going out and just like meeting random people and, and just uh, growing my contact book. You know, it's just, I'm, not, I'm fearless when it comes to like saying hello to people and, and just uh, building relationships. So yeah, that's, uh, that's my biggest hobby. <laughs> Is there is there like um, let, let's say like if, if you were on a on a lonely island is there uh, th like three movies that you would take on a lonely island which ones would these be? Wait, would you kill me if I told you that I'm not a big movie person? Oh, that's that's, that's totally fine. fine, man. I do love Scarface. I mean, hmm. it's such a good movie. He, you know, is somebody who came from from nothing and be, and created an em an empire. So many people <laughs> doubted him and told him he couldn't do it, and then he proved everybody wrong. I mean, he, he, he was drugged out on his own fame and, and his own success, which is not, not cool. But yeah. I think it, what I, the deeper meaning behind the movie, you know, him coming from nothing and creating an impact is what I love. But yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of great movies out there. Um, not off the top of my head. <laughs> I can't think of it. Maybe we choose another one for the end. Are there any favorite music genres outside of country? I love R&B music. I love mm -hmm. hip hop mm -hmm. and I love electronic music, big electronic music because uh, uh, I'm from Miami and that's mm. a, a big hub for, ED, for EDM. So I grew up listening to a lot of it and uh, I'm going to be exploring myself, um, you know, writing more records in that, in the EDM realm very soon. Nice. Oh, cool. you, sh you should definitely, you should definitely visit Berlin and kind of explore and discover the EDM scene because we have a really, really big one here in Germany. In, in oh, Berlin. really? Yeah. yeah. I was just yeah. there and I had no idea. So. <laughs> cool. yeah. You were nice. Yeah. All right. That was a wonderful interview. Thanks so much for a lot of those insights. And yeah. to give you the final words, last minute is yours. Tell the listeners whatever you want them to know. Stage is yours. I love it. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I will say be fearless. Don't be afraid to take chances. You know, utilize all these tools that are, you know, that we're blessed with. You know, we're in 2023 and, you know, we don't realize that our phone 
literally our, our cell phones uh, mm. have the ability to change our lives. We just have to know how to use them wisely. You know, make sure to take care of your relationships. Um, balance. The key word is of 2023 for me is balance. Um, make sure that you make time for your body, your temple, because not, not, nothing that you do in life means anything unless, you know, your body and your mind and your soul are healthy. And also remember your purpose. Don't build anything just because it's like, what's the, because it's cool and because that's what everybody else is doing. Do it because, you know, you have something to say and, 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 you know, there's a purpose behind it. So, um, stay real, stay authentic and, uh, you know, stay hungry. Beautiful, beautiful last famous words. Amazing. Um, we could not be more uh, thankful for having you on, Sammy, and we wish you all the best. We'll put all of the links uh, that are relevant to your collection, to your Twitter, TikTok, etc., in the show notes, so the listener uh, can check it out. And we hope, uh, like with all of the other cases, that this provides um, some insights into how music artists are embracing NFTs and are trying to. Uh, build on the future and are embracing this technology to make a living a sustainable living for themselves and create beautiful music for our fans so thank you very much sammy we wish you a great day and hope to see you thank soon you. sounds good guys right. take it easy take care right. yeah. ciao chris before we end this episode yeah. if someone in the music industry may it be a fan a label a distributor or someone else in the industry be interested in joining web3 How would they do this? Well, they could write us an email uh, at digitalpunkspodcast at gmail.com. And good. we're more than happy to um, help them along the way, uh, show them some opportunities, and uh, we'll, we'll do something good together. So, Sounds great. 